Hello everyone and welcome to One Civil Law. For today's case, we're going back in time. This is a 1978 case from the United States Tax Court. This is the case of Philip Johnson versus the Commissioner for the IRS. In this case, Mr. Johnson doesn't think that he should have to pay income tax. And so he's raising a bunch of objections as to why the income tax law is unconstitutional or illegal or otherwise not applicable to him. So he's a tax denier. So we're going back in time to read some of the rationales as to whether or not you have to pay income tax. So we're going back to some of these foundational cases. Someone had requested it. We had to get around to it sometime. So let's get started with this. Respondent determined a deficiency of $724 in petitioner's federal income tax for the year 1974. As someone who at the time of this recording is currently trying to do his taxes, I suppose this is a pertinent and timely issue for us. Can I, can I be forced to pay income tax? Let's find out. The deficiency arose from respondent's disallowance for lack of adequate substantiation of certain portion of deductions claimed to have been paid or incurred by the petitioner in 1974 for real estate taxes, charitable contributions, and other miscellaneous expenses. So in other words, he tried to deduct things and the person at the IRS said, you didn't provide enough proof that this actually happened, so you don't get to do these allowances. So you owe us, owe us another $724. Okay. At trial, petitioner declined to pre present substancing evidence with respect to the item, although the court repeatedly urged them to do so. Instead, she, so we got a female tax denier here, instead she chose to base her case on several constitutional challenges to the federal income tax law and its specific application to her. Good luck. She also attempted to withdraw without prejudice her petition in this court, presumably to file a complaint in the federal district court. So one of the things you can do in terms of like where things are being filed, like if one of the things that's being issued is the tax that's due, you can bring that before the tax court, which deals with taxes, and you might be able to also bring that in federal district court, right? So you might have your choice of venue depending on the circumstances. And you filed in one place and you now may be filed in a different place. So does the court have to let you do that? No, but they're gonna explain why. Although petitioner's allegations do not easily lend themselves to precise and con concise restatement, in other words, they're a jobbled mess of unclarity, but we, the court, are gonna do our best to try to figure out what you meant to say. Despite your efforts, we are going to try to figure out what you meant to say and give you full faith to that. So we're gonna give it a shot. Her constitutional challenges are as follows. The federal income sta tax statute is unconstitutional, having no f foundation in the 16th Amendment. Well, you know, since the 16th Amendment is directly about taxing authority, good luck with that argument on the federal tax it has no basis in the 16th Amendment. That should be entertaining. Respondent's determination of deficiency was not only an impermissible bill of attainder, which, by the way, a bill of attainder is when a legislature passes a law that says you're guilty of something criminally. That's a bill of attainder. When they just pass a law that says you are guilty, like flat out, you're actually guilty of the crime in question. You're just guilty. That's a bill of attainder. So apparently this is a bill of attainder. Okay. It was also arbitrary in violation of the First Amendment right to petition for government of redress of grievances. How? How was it a violation of those things? The Fourth Amendment to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures and Fifth Amendment due process rights. No. You're getting due process as we speak because you know you're before a court so that's not a thing placing burden of proof upon petitioner in the process violates the fifth amendment right against self-incrimination and other constitutional provisions no you know we want you to show your work you don't think you should have to pay taxes we'd like to have some evidence of it for example some receipts of your charitable gifting or something would be nice a nice to have to show that you actually did these things please provide us evidence that you did this so we can adjust your taxes. You don't want to tell us about it. So, you know, we can't consider it. But you're going to say it's a Fifth Amendment issue. Sure. In this case, was in contravention of our Sixth Amendment right to counsel. No, because it's not criminal. And Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial. No, because it's, you know, no. And this may be my personal favorite slash least favorite part of it. The federal income tax placed petitioners in condition of involuntary serv servitude in violation of the 13th Amendment. So the 13th Amendment, for those of you who are remembering, is the one that prohibits slavery. So it's the 13th Amendment prohibits, makes the income tax illegal, even though the 16th Amendment explicitly talks about the income tax. 
So, you know, that isn't an overreach in any way. Okay, good. Before addressing the substantive arguments, there's actually substantive arguments. Oh, well. We stay at the outset. We must deny the motion to dismiss, which is an attempt to withdraw the petition without prejudice. The jurisdiction of this court is invoked when a taxpayer who has a statutory notice of deficiency files a timely petition with the court to redetermine such deficiency. So remember, one of their complaints was, hey, you denied me my right to petition for redress of grievances. Well, the court is saying, no, not so much. Not only did we deny it, you specifically asked us for it and we're giving it to you as we speak literally right now. So you filed a petition for redress with this court. We are now considering your petition. So how can we deny your petition when we're actually considering as we speak right now? I don't know how this is definitely how this is happening though. Once invoked, the jurisdiction of the court is exclusive with respect to the years in, in, included. So if you bring it before the tax court, we're the only one who can consider this issue. Fair enough. Moreover, if the court dismisses a case after petition is filed for any reason other than lack of jurisdiction, a decision must be entered as to the amount of deficiency. So if even if we deny your case, we have to like say what the amount due is. And that makes sense, right? We have to like provide notice as to how much you owe. Consequently, even if we were to grant the motion, not only would a subsequent suit in the federal district court be barred, but our dismissal would operate as an adjudication on the merits. So the district court is saying like, okay, if we actually do what you're asking us to do, you'd actually be more hosed than you would otherwise. You know, you can't see what's going to happen. So let us just try to calmly explain to you what's going to happen if we do this. Once our jurisdiction is invoked, we're the only ones who can do this. So as a result of that, the district court no longer has jurisdiction. They might have had jurisdiction in the first instance, maybe, but you invoke our jurisdiction. And so once that's done, it's done. And now we're the only one who has jurisdiction. So you can't go flee off the district court now because we're the only ones who have jurisdiction because you asked for it. You know, this is the consequence of asking for stuff. Sometimes you actually get it. So now we have jurisdiction. So if we were to do this, if we were to grant your motion, you wouldn't be able to file in district court because we're the only ones. Also, because we did it because you asked, you couldn't file here because we dismissed it because you asked and you'd have an adjudication on the merits. So you'd actually be worse off if we granted it to you because you'd have no claim of relief anywhere. So us being super, super nice are not only going to try to interpret your petition to figure out what it is you meant to say, despite your best efforts of your garbled nonsense, we're going to try to figure out what it meant to say. We're also in the effort of being super, super nice, not going to grant your motion to dismiss because you can't see it would actually screw you. So we're going to prevent you from har harming yourself and we're going to figure out what your petition meant and figure out whether or not you have a claim of relief. We're just being really, really super nice. We are saving you in spite of yourselves. That's how nice we're being. We are, we are a nice court. According to the petitioner, the framers of the 16th Amendment envisioned an indirect excise tax on corporations such as that contained in the Tariff Act of 1909. Since petitioner is, and here are the magic words, since petitioner is an individual sovereign citizen, check, and the federal income tax is direct progressive, she claims she's not subject to the tax. No. No. Although petitioner's sincere sincerity and devotion to the principle cannot be gainsaid, in other words, we're not going to evaluate whether or not you actually believe this. We are not going to try to crawl into the depths of your mind and try to figure out whether or not you actually believe this stuff or are just saying it. So we're not going to try to un, 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 undo that riddle. So we'll, we'll just we'll just take it for granted you actually believe this. The constitutional challenge to federal income tax must be rejected. No, you don't say. The constitutionality of federal income tax passed since the enactment of the 16th Amendment has been upheld judicially on too many occasions for us presently to rethink the underlying validity thereof. See example bunch of cases. Furthermore, the 16th Amendment was enacted in response to the Supreme Court's decision in Pollock, which held unconstitutional the income tax of 1894 as a direct tax without apportionment. So in the original constitution, as it was originally drafted, you had two different kinds of taxes. You have direct taxes and you have indirect taxes. The constitution as originally drafted said that if you're going to do a direct tax, it has to be done with apportionment. So among other things, one of the things you'd have to do is you'd have to make sure it's even as to citizenship. 
So you'd have to like make sure everyone is equally impacted. You'd have to look at citizenship data into the things. And so under this under this 1894 case, they said, well, this tax you're trying to do is a direct tax because it's an income tax. Again, under the Constitution as it originally existed, that would be a direct tax because it's directly to you as an individual. That is what we mean by a direct tax, as opposed to an indirect tax where it's like tax not directly on you, but as something incidental to something else. So like a sales tax is probably not a direct tax. It's probably an indirect tax because it's not directly against you. An income tax is directly against you. You know, it's your, we're taxing it directly as you get the money, not incidentally to something else. So the 1894 case said, well, if you're going to do that, it has to be apportioned. Okay. Well, the, the constitution was changed. That was the entire point of the 16th amendment. So the 16th amendment says explicitly that you no longer have to do apportionment to solve that issue. So now under both a direct tax and an indirect tax, it does not have to be done with apportionment. That was the entire point of the 16th amendment is to remove that requirement. It was a requirement of the original constitution, but someone proposed a change and it got ratified. And so, well, now that's the constitution now. So now it doesn't have to be done with apportionment because the constitution has been changed. That was the entire point. Thus, since the ratification of the 16th amendment is immaterial with respect to income taxes, whether it's a direct tax or indirect tax. Yeah. We no longer have to figure out that question, right? We don't even have to ask the question if an income tax is a direct tax. In my explanation, I just said just now, I said it was a direct tax, but I suppose you could quibble with that. You could say, no, it's actually an indirect tax. And so we could actually have an argument. Is it an indirect tax or direct tax? Now, personally, I'd say it's a direct tax, but I suppose we could have an argument about it. But the court just says we don't have to. We don't have to have an argument about it because it doesn't matter anymore if it's direct tax or indirect tax. Either way, the apportionment issue is irrelevant. So is an income tax, direct tax, or an indirect tax? We don't know. We don't care because it doesn't matter either way anymore. Okay, that makes sense. With regard to other constitutional claims, petitioner fares no better than she did with the principal challenge. Her contention that the respondent's notice of deficiency was an impermissible bill of attainder is without merit, not for the least of reasons that an executive agency can't do a bill of anything because they are not a legislature. An executive branch agency can't do a bill of anything. Only legislatures can do bills. I'm just a bill. Only a bill. Sitting here on Capitol Hill. So yeah, the, the, it, can, it cannot be the case that whatever the commissioner did was a bill of anything because they can't do bills of anything, including bills of attainder. A bill of attainder, according to Black's Law Dictionary, every sovereign citizen's favorite dictionary, right, is a legislative act, right? We can just stop reading immediately. A legislative act. We can just stop reading. Because whatever the commissioner of tax is doing, it is not a legislative act. But we'll keep reading anyway. A legislative act directed against a designated person pronouncing him guilty of an alleged crime, usually treason, but it could be any crime, without trial or conviction, according to a recognized rule of procedure, and passing sentence of death or attainder upon him. Attainder would just be any punishment. So as I said, a bill of attainder is a is a legislature passing a law declaring you guilty of something and sentencing you to such such a thing that's a bill of attainder this is not that not for the least of reasons that you know the taxing authority is not a legislative act because it's not the legislature you're in the wrong domain so we could have just stopped reading after the first three words but we finished the entire de definition just for you it is wholly irrelevant to speak of a bill of attainder in the civil proceeding involving tax liability it sure is because the executive can't do a bill of anything at all under any circumstances because they're not a legislature. Yeah. It is clear that response deficiency determination was not arbitrary. Yeah. Cause it was, you know, just general me mechanistic application of law. We didn't do it to harm you personally. It did not violate your first, fourth or fifth amendment rights citing law. The deficiency determination is presumptively correct. And petitioner has the burden of proving it's erroneous. The IRS does, in fact, make mistakes. You know, they are just an organization like anyone else. They make mistakes. And if you can show that they're wrong by, you know, providing evidence, then they're wrong. And courts rule against the IRS all the time. So for all the people out there who are saying, hey, a court isn't ruling against the IRS because they're afraid of getting audited or something. Well, no, not so much. Courts rule against the IRS like all the time on all kinds of issues. They're not afraid of getting audited. And they don't care anyway, because like the, the IRS ability to audit doesn't matter if you are paying all the taxes owed. 
Like, do I really care that much if the IRS audits me? Not really. I mean, it will be irritating and it will take time, so that's a little annoying. But at the end of the day, I don't really mind that much because, you know, there's not a whole lot to audit. And I've already paid all my taxes. And if somehow I didn't pay some of my taxes, it was due to a genuine oversight, so I'm not guilty of anything anyway. So I don't really care about an audit because, you know, the IRS doesn't have some sort of magic power over me. All they can do is say, okay, well, you failed and you should pay us some more money. And either they're right or not. So, you know, a court isn't really afraid of them either. You know, it's not like the IRS can just, like, do stuff. The contention that placing the burden of proof upon this case violates the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination is without substance. No, it doesn't. That's not what the Fifth Amendment had in mind. Neither does she, neither does respondent, given the court any reason to believe a criminal investigation is presently underway or even remotely possible. The sole purpose of the present case is to determine the existence, if any, of the federal tax liability. And accordingly, the general rule with respect to burden of proof in tax cases is appropriate. Right? So this is a civil case. It is a civil case at this point because it's not criminal, right? The issue we're trying to determine at this exact moment in time is your liability for tax, which is a civil issue. So we're under civil rules. And one of the things can we can do with civil rules is burden shifting, right? Is burden shifting. So like the IRS has the initial burden to show the deficiency, which they, which they will do. And the way they'll do this is they'll say, well, you know, here are the records you submitted and these records are not valid because of here's some reasons. And so they have that initial burden. The IRS has the initial burden. And then it comes back to you. You have now a burden to show why the IRS is wrong. It says, no, IRS, you got it wrong because, you know, here's some additional documentation. Here's some additional evidence. Here's some additional whatever. And you have to come back with some stuff. So burden shifting, not unusual, particularly in a civil case. It is not a constitutional violation, not a problem. Neither petitioner's Sixth Amendment right to counsel nor the Seventh Amendment right to trial, trial, jury trial has been violated. The right to counsel extends only to criminal proceedings. Yes, it does. You know, it, it's pretty clear it's only criminal. So if you're civil, you can provide your own lawyer, but one does not have to be provided to you. So it is inapplicable to this case, citing law. That's the law as much today as it is as it ever been. Further, the petitioner was afforded a full opportunity to represent themselves at trial pursuant to law. There is no right to a jury trial in tax court and therefore does not violate the Seventh Amendment because the right to a jury trial only existed to the extent it existed at the common law at the time, right? So the right to the jury trial is a pre-existing right. So when you're looking to see whether or not you have a right to a jury trial, even in a civil case, you'd look to see whether or not you had a right to a jury trial in the English law at the time. And you didn't have the right to a jury trial for this kind of civil issue. And also like, the issues at hand are also legal, not factual. And also there is a right of redress to like arbitrariness as well. So no, you don't have a right to a jury trial because you never did. It was not within the scope of what the Seventh Amendment was talking about. So no. Petitioners claim that federal income tax places her in a position of involuntary servitude in contravention of the 13th Amendment is unsubstantial and without merit. And we're just not going to say anymore because it's that dumb. It is just that dumb. No, that was not what the 13th Amendment was talking about. It was not what the 13th Amendment was talking about on any level, right? The Constitution as it existed from square one had taxing authority. You know, the, the, the authority of Congress to do taxes, the authority of state to do taxes was part of the reason the Constitution was created in the first place. One of the deficiencies of the Articles of Confederation was the inability of the federal government to lay a tax that was mandatory. They could vote for taxes, but they were optional. As a result, they not a lot of people stayed, not a lot of states paid. So one of the things the Articles of Confederation failed at was exactly this. One of the reasons the Constitution was created was to solve this problem. So taxes are no longer mandatory or no longer optional. They're mandatory. And then there's like, okay, well, we put in a 13th Amendment that says you can't be held in slavery. But we also put in a 16th Amendment that says it wasn't meant to deal with taxes. The 13th Amendment did not have taxes in mind. It has slavery in mind. And, you know, this is not that. And for you to, to say it is, is a little bit disingenuous and a little bit um, tone deaf with respect to what the 13th Amendment was trying to accomplish. So, no, not so much. We reiterate the petitioner has the burden of proving the respondent's determination is erroneous. In our view, the rejection of the constitutional challenges to the federal income tax laws and refusal to present any evidence at trial substantiate the deductions. 
and we have no alternative but to sustain the determination. Accordingly, we hold petitioners not entitled to deduct amounts paid by the 1974 real estate taxes, charitable contributions, and other miscellaneous expenses in the amounts previously allowed by a respondent. You know, maybe if you had provided some evidence of some variety, maybe, but not so much. So you have to pay the taxes. So yeah. So that is the end of the 1978 case of Philip Johnson, or Phyllis Johnson, I should say. Phyllis Johnson versus Commissioner. In this case, we learned Phyllis didn't want to pay income taxes, and they appealed to the tax court. And the tax court said, but the 16th Amendment, though. And Phyllis said, but it wasn't meant to apply to this. It was only meant to apply to, like, corporate earnings or something. And, well, you know, the, the plain text of the 16th Amendment doesn't say anything like even remotely close to that. It's pretty unlimited in its scope. You know, it, it's, it says that you can just have taxes and you don't have to be apportioned. So your idea that it only applies to corporate taxes or something is like, well, I don't know. We can all read, and the 16th Amendment doesn't say anything remotely close to that. So, no. And, you know, this is not the 13th Amendment. This is not slavery, no. And you have to pay taxes. And you you don't have a right to a jury trial. And, you, you sure, you can invoke the 5th Amendment, but, you know, it can be held against you because this is a civil case, not criminal. So we can hold it against you. So, you know, you didn't provide any evidence, so you have to pay taxes. So, so a sovereign citizen went to tax court in 1978 and in 1978, the court said, no, you have to pay taxes. And sovereign citizens have been trying ever since. But, you know, not so much. This decision was completely right. And that's the end of this case. Thank you for joining me as we both read this case together and now better understand the law. If you're enjoying this legal education content, please subscribe to this channel. It really helps us grow. And check out one of our other videos, including the one that's currently being displayed on the thumbnail on screen. Thank you so much for your continued support. And until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.